Okay, welcome back. Uh, let's have a short time of prayer uh, at this uh, uh, particular time. We're praying for deliverance. Um, and uh, these prayers are uh, 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 given to us by the 24-7 group. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you to protect us from the spread of the coronavirus. You are powerful and merciful. Let this be our prayer. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster is past. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of Peace. We remember those living in coronavirus hotspots and those currently in isolation. May they know your presence in their isolation, your peace in their turmoil, and your patience in their waiting. Prince of Peace, you are powerful and merciful. Let this be their prayer. May your mercy come quickly to meet us for we are in desperate need. Help us, God our Saviour, for the glory of your name. God of all comfort and counsel, we pray for those who are grieving, reeling from the sudden loss of loved ones, remembering the Harris Befendis particularly this week. May they find your fellowship in their suffering, your comfort in their loss, and your hope in their despair. We name before you those known to us who are vulnerable and scared, the frail, the sick, and the elderly. I'll give you a moment to do that. God of all comfort, you are powerful and merciful. May this be our prayer. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Amen. Now I'll invite Joyce to give us our next reading which is from Romans chapter 1. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you, in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the Gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Amen.
So if you've been with us before, you, we've been celebrating what Jesus has done for us at Easter time. And we've been remembering who he is for us in the I Am sayings in John's Gospel we've been looking at recently. But what comes next? What are we to do in response to what Jesus has done for us? Today we're starting a new series of reflections, walking, I, I hope, through the book of Romans together under the theme of More Than Conquerors. And I'll be giving you some questions for personal reflection or for discussion in your family at home uh, on, the serv- on the order of service uh, that you can follow up afterwards. We know that Jews had been in Rome since the Roman conquest a hundred years before. And we also know Christians were there right from the start. At Pentecost, we read in Acts 2 that they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, they said. So they saw the Holy Spirit at work. They heard Peter's gospel. And they were among the 3,000 who were believed on that day and were baptised, who returned and started church in Rome. So they were going well before Paul himself was converted. Paul, who was in himself a Roman citizen, but who'd never visited his his home city. Later on in Acts, we read that in Corinth, Paul met a Jew named Aquila, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because the Emperor Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. This was probably after some infighting between Jews and Christians, and is historically attested. And later on, we read, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, but said, after I've been there, I must visit Rome also. This was at the end of Paul's third missionary journey, preparing for his fourth, which would include this visit to Rome. And so he writes to them, starting his letter typically with uh, words of thanksgiving, words of remembering them before God, with longing for his beloved brothers and sisters, as he put it. But he had some explaining to do. If he was, as he claimed, the apostle to the Gentiles, why hadn't he come to the capital of the Gentile world? All roads lead to Rome, everyone knew that. But Paul explained that he had prior duties to the churches he had started elsewhere in Europe. He had to go to Jerusalem to deliver a money collection which was made in Europe for the church in Judea. He was trying this way to help unite the church of the Gentiles to the church of the Jews. He wanted to come, but had so far been prevented. But he'd made definite plans. And what would be his purpose for visiting? Two things he mentions in this passage. Verse 11 He wanted to share a gift. And secondly, in verse 13, he wanted to reap a harvest. He wants to give them something and receive something also from them. What is the gift he wanted to share? The gospel according to Paul. That's what some people call this book of Romans, quite rightly. Before our four Gospels were ever written, Paul is here using the term gospel for the first time. But the idea of gospel is based on the Old Testament idea of good news. Good news of the victory of God in history. For example, as Isaiah put it, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, 
your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the light of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. This is the good news, the gospel. And this good news of salvation for all was exactly what the hopes had always been hoping for. What Jesus prays for when he says, deliver us from evil. A salvation that includes justification from guilt, sanctification into holiness and glory of eternal life. So Paul understood the gospel as God's powerful plan, clarified, as he thought, through the implications of Jesus' life, death and resurrection for himself. The gospel as both the saving act and the communication of that act to others to share in it. From the moment of his own conversion, Paul knew that this was his job, his calling, to evangelise in order to grow churches, obliged both to Jews and what he calls barbarians, Greeks or anyone who's not Jewish. And how does he describe this gospel? Verses 16 to 17 is what scholars call his proposio, the central thesis he will, which will explain uh, the whole of the rest of the book. And it's this. The one who is righteous will be saved. The one who is justified will live. This is a term from the law courts. The judge has heard the case and gives a verdict of innocent. All right, in the clear, justified. We see righteousness as a combination of God's saving action given through the preaching of the evangelist and the believer's right standing, receiving and responding to that action. How does this work? Paul understands from the verse he quotes, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, that this righteousness arises from faith, by faith unto faith, as he puts it, faith from first to last, based on faith, and addressed to faith, by faith and by no other means. God in Jesus has made a new covenant with humanity, and if we believe we are proved correct and are blessed, that belief in God's promises gives us steadfastness. That loyalty to God's word means in the end the wicked will not triumph. So why does God do this? He wants us to have real life, the eternal kind of life. This is the purpose of this state of righteousness Paul talks of. And I hope we will enjoy exploring this bold statement, God God willing, over the next few weeks. 500 years ago, 1500 years after Paul wrote these words, a German monk called Martin Luther was asked to give a lecture, actually a lecture on Psalm 31, which we read from at the beginning of this time together. But he got stuck in Psalm 31 at verse 1, where it says, Deliver me in your righteousness. And he wondered, what did David mean by praying that? Surely the holiness of God meant He's not going to save me. He's going to condemn me. But then Martin Luther's attention was drawn to our passage, Romans 1, verse 17. The righteous will live by faith. Suddenly he realised that God justifies us by our faith in his grace and mercy. 
Later, he would describe this realization as his gateway to heaven. And his conversion would begin the reformation of the church in the world. This is power, God's own righteousness revealed. The gospel, the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Unstoppable and forever. Amen. Let's just take a moment of reflection on those words together. Let's pray. Just ask the Holy Spirit uh, what he might be saying to you through these words we consider today. Do you know this power of God that brings salvation for yourself? Take a step of faith today. Do you long to share a spiritual gift as Paul was offering? Do something today about it. Are you thankful for those God has given to you? Remember one another in your prayers today. Now I'm going to invite, as we draw to a close of this uh, time together, uh, Joyce back to read uh, the last verses from Psalm 31. Praise be to the Lord, for he showed me the wonders of his love when I was in a city under siege. In my alarm I said, I am cut off from your sight, yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Love the Lord, all his faithful people. The Lord preserves those who are true to him, but the proud he pays back in full. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Amen. Let's pray a word of blessing on each other uh, as we close. Uh, after this, the, the song I'm suggesting you might want to sing along to is called Cornerstone. It's one that we've sung uh, a number of times here. But the first verse there says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for this time. We do hope in you, in the Lord. We hope in the wonders of your love in the siege times that we're in. We thank you that we are not cut off, but you hear us and you preserve us. Thanks be to God. Amen.